Cool fact, a crocodile can't stick out its tongue. Also, you can get health insurance for a month or just under a year in some states. United Healthcare short-term insurance plans, underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, offer flexible, budget-friendly coverage for you. Learn more at UH1.com. This episode is brought to you by Dermalogica and the iconic Daily Microfoliant. This bestseller gently exfoliates away dirt and debris to reveal instantly smoother, brighter skin. Add it to your daily routine to minimize blackheads and dullness while improving the look of dark spots, even on sensitive skin. Try it yourself and discover why it's a fan favorite. Shop now at Dermalogica.com slash Spotify and use code Spotify for a special gift with purchase. Well, hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Join me, Sam Harris, on my journey of curiosity and growth. I have conversations with some of the world's most fascinating humans, from billionaires to Olympians, and most everyone in between, such as suspiciously happy people and even a hitman. Success isn't just for successful people, it is earned and you can earn it too. I find out how ordinary people become extraordinary to fuel your own growth mindset. Today on the podcast, I'm interviewing Stuart Chapman, who is one of the co-founders of Draper Esprit, one of the UK's and Europe's leading VC firms. And they're one of the only VC firms, if not the only one, to have publicly listed. And yeah, they're they're a really cool company and they've got some good ethics. And it's just really interesting to break down how someone goes from being like a normal human when they were born to a VC company, which is just raising like stupid amounts of millions of money and putting them into big businesses. And it's just like a lot of big jumps, you'd think, but it's quite interesting to see how it kind of quite naturally happened from Stuart just with like having a growth mindset, taking on new risks and things. They're a really cool company and they've, they've backed a lot of big names like Grays, TransferWise, Free Trade, Revolut and well, lots more. Anyway, yeah, just an interesting person and cool things that he's up to and just lots and lots of wisdom that he shares with us. So put on your thinking caps and buckle in. Welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Today I have Stu Chapman on the podcast. Could you tell us a quick like three minute story? Uh, sure. So I was born to a regular family and regular parents in a loving home in Eastbourne on the south coast. From there I went to Loughborough University. Fantastic place. In fact, actually, I got back to Loughborough in that they come around to the alum asking for money. And I said, are you still teaching that venture capital course that you taught me? 1980s, I think. And they said, yes, one of our great courses. I said, well, either you got a lot better at it or you're still teaching the same old rubbish that you taught me. Two weeks later, the dean of the school came down and said, I hear you've been rubbishing one of my courses. And that's not true. I've been in this industry for 20 years and yet you've never asked me what it is. And yet I can make the textbooks come alive in terms of uh, you know, what real entrepreneurship is and what, how real people react. And so he said, well, you better come and join the advisory board. So for the last 10 years, I've been on the advisory board at Loughborough University in the business school. Um, all about this connection with the working world to get real data in the hands of the students to complement the academic studies. I ended up through a graduate scheme at what was Midland Bank and now HSBC, and I was doing an arbitrage trading system. Today, I would be called a business analyst. As a graduate of Midland Bank, you could jump to a graduate scheme of a sister company. And in 1992, I joined 3i the venture capital company here in the UK. My big break at 3i came when, after you do your 18-month apprentice, they needed a CRM system to take a a lead from first meeting all the way through to investment, all the way through to exit. They wanted someone from the investment stream to head up the project. At the time, 3i rewarded all of its investors by doing investments. So taking a step backwards and working in the IT team was not considered to be a great career choice for a venture mm. capitalist. But I volunteered. I was a youngster. Right? I didn't do no better. Um, it found out that I was the only one who had done any coding. And so it was a natural progression. But it turned out to be my biggest break, my biggest bit of luck. To sell the software to the users, I had to go and meet all the directors. 3i was a fiefdom of offices, and the local director ran the local office as if it was his own entity. So they all had individual personalities and were all very charismatic. 1995, when I came back to the investment stream, every director that had a tech deal that came across their desk would say, that strange guy in London, he knows about tech. Give him a call. 
you don't need to be that good on tech history to realize 95, 96, 97, mm. 98 were all kind of boom years. My reward for being part of that kind of boom period was I was given the opportunity to go to Silicon Valley and open up Three Eyes office here in California. I would say that's probably where my venture capital training really started. And I was there for five years, came back to the UK, 2004. We came back because uh, uh, we had twins. And I really loved being in California. I didn't love being part of a corporate you know, here in Europe. And so in 2005, I joined up with Simon Cook. And then in 2006, we founded Esprit. Venture capital firm invested in technology here in Europe, enterprise consumer, digital health, semiconductors. We did that for 10 years, standard format. 2016, we listed. Quite unusual thing to do for venture capital. Other people have listed funds. There's even some managers that are listed. But to list the funds and the manager together as a trading company is quite rare. We did it because we would get offered access to city institutions that wanted to participate in the entrepreneurial stage of growth and company building, but could only do it through public shares. And so we were a look through for them. Three years later, we've grown and we haven't looked back. So I guess there's a snapshot. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks for providing lots of food for thought. And I quite like your sort of initial sayings about going to the Loughborough Uni and sort of being like, actually, I can make it real for people because that's kind of, I guess, what I'm trying to do with the podcast and like growth mindset. You started the podcast saying you're just like an ordinary person and like you hear about exceptional people and you kind of think that like they were just always going to be exceptional and like for everyone starts just like a normal person. They just like, it's their choices and like their passion and drive that gets them there. It's just trying to show that people can like, get to being extraordinary just by like what they do it's not like you were born it kind of thing and so it was a nice explanation of that so then moving on to like three eyes uh training and things you said you sort of learned a lot about like vcs was it just like by default that you just happened to be like talking to them anyway or do you think that you also showed up in the right way besides just that you were there and they kind of knew that you were coding and things do you think that you kind of also, did you like do any follow up? Were you always going to be like, oh, how else can I help you? And like, did you do anything yourself to open uh, doors? So, Sabria was a unique organization. Mm. Um, it was made up of small teams. And, and coming from Loughborough and background, you know, the analogy of sports teams and how good teams work together to play to one another's skills to win championships or to win titles it was a simplistic way of viewing how a good team you operate. And so, I always enjoyed being that glue of a team. I was never a solo player. I was always a participant in a sports team as opposed to you know, on my own individual skill. I worked very hard at keeping the, the team together. One of the hardest things at 3i was venture capital in 1992 was defined as ri- anything risk capital. So what we might consider today as private equity or buyouts, it, it was all considered to be venture capital. So as a 25-year-old, I was being sent to the boardrooms of 55-year-old white middle-class men who didn't have to listen to young people. And so getting your voice heard meant that you had to develop skills, be their friend, be their confidant, be their value-add partner, be their recruiter, be their marketeer, be their advocate. So I learned very early on in my career that if I wanted to get anything done, you you have to work very hard, but you had to offer them value. So the idea of highlighting issues and trying to make it them think that they're seeing it themselves, you know, became a skill that you got taught quite early on the 3i. The 3i HR person told me that they hired on two qualities. They hired on people's empathy levels and they hired on their resilience. Venture capital is a bit weird in some ways in that you see so many businesses but we only invest here in 12 new companies a year. Maybe 3,000 come through the door. Mm. So you, you're you a professional sayer of no. So it, you're in that regard, I think that the two qualities that they, they hired on, I think still have their relevance today. But they seem pretty like overarching, useful. <laughs> Are those the things that you hire on? Yeah. I mean, the venture capital has got a bit more sophisticated. So you are looking for some domain knowledge. Sometimes you're looking for some expertise. But once you've made the investment, 
you make the investment by winning the entrepreneur's trust. Once you've made the investment, you're maybe together for seven to 10 years. And so I try and tell the, the young investors here, you know, that's 84 to 100 board meetings that mm. you've got to make an influence. You've got to help them. It's a very different relationship than a financial relationship. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, as a VC, it's like some kind of difference, but how involved are you with the companies in your portfolio? We're most definitely not operational. Mm. Um, so it's not like you help them with hiring or anything? Or? We help them in hiring in a different way than you might imagine. Mm. So why would the best salesman in New York join a young, com- a young British company? Mm. But, you know, if you think about the salesman's options, <laughs> you can go to the most... The, the best well-known New York company, the best well-known US company, the best well-funded local company before he gets to a company he's never heard of. So our help in hiring in some ways is actually to provide the strength to the entrepreneur that he's funded, that he's backed. The salesman should look through the entrepreneur to the backers to see the other businesses they've backed and why this one will be successful. So it's definitely a most support function in that area. And the same with the fundraising We do exactly the same. We provide the support to the entrepreneur. But at the end of the day, the entrepreneur is the person the investors are backing. Mm. I like to, the analogy I've used sometimes is like a a stage show. No one will come to the stage show if the actors aren't there. But if you don't have stage hands, it's quite difficult to put a play on. And in that analogy, you kind of wear the stage hands. Yeah, I like that. Makes sense. I like a good analogy. <laughs> it helps me because I'm not one yeah. for the spotlight, so I quite mm. like being behind the curtain. So. Yeah, it's interesting. It matches my personality. Yeah, it does make you think a bit. Because I'm, I'm, I interviewed like uh, the end of Tech Stars, and it sort of it sounds like it's quite nice to kind of you get to talk to lots of companies and sort of give them advice and come up with lots of ideas and be there creative and entrepreneurial the whole time, but you don't have to then go and execute on all the things that you're sort of advising or doing and you don't have all like the low moments of like oh this is useless and stuff and you, you definitely don't have all the eggs in one basket yeah i would say the hardest thing you know, is for venture capital you know young venture capital investors is there's not that many financial success highs so celebrating success of a sale celebrate the success of the first million you have to do that because otherwise, it's a long road. Definitely, yeah. But it still can be hard just for any entrepreneur. You know, you're always think, looking forward to what's next. So it can be kind of hard to like appreciate in the moment of how far you've come and stuff. And you're always aware of the things that are going wrong. So even when you are doing something really well, you're still like aware of the problems you haven't fixed. And yeah. so they're a human thing wherever you are. That's like where you are. And I think as an attitude, it's the simplest thing I implemented in my 20s mm. that enabled me to focus on small steps of progress rather than reflecting on failure. A pretty timeless life lesson. A story I was told was a US story, so and I'm, I'm going to butcher it, so please forgive. But it was about the high-performing people of a business school class and how you know, the best student you know, got involved in, in, in investment banking because it was the highest paid and that's what they were told the best student, the best opportunity mm. to go to. And he went climbing his mountain. And at first it was great because he was earning loads more money than his peers. And then he started missing some key milestones. He missed some engagement parties. He got to the point where he was missing some weddings. To the point he said, no, that's it. I'm definitely going to this next wedding. Mm. And he flew into San Francisco late. He didn't have a hotel booked. And he ended up crashing on the, the couch of one of his best friends. And at 5 a.m. in the morning, the best friend was up and the best friend was, was coding. What are you doing? It's 5 a.m. in the morning. He said, oh, no, I've got to, the, the, you know, this is my baby. This is the startup I'm doing. I'm going to change the world. And so he, you know, curious and looking over his shoulder and he started watching. The story as it goes through and when the gentleman tells it, it was actually the man was, was climbing the wrong mountain. Mm. He thought the highest peak was his peak. But actually when the cloud parted, it, the peak was actually in the distance. And the story I took away from it was that us as humans don't have a reverse gear. We, we much prefer to carry on going up, even if it's the wrong mountain. Yeah, yeah. Then actually go, this is the wrong, let's run backwards and run to the next mountain. 
Mm. And, and so that kind of stuck with me as you know, like as I do the careers advice to the to the 17, 18 year olds and the and then go on to the graduates. You know, is that between this period of eighteen to thirty, remember you have a reverse gear and run, try and run up as many mountains as you possibly can. <laughs> because you will find the one whose peak is the highest for you, and that's where you will strive and where you you go to. In some ways, my my career has been a little bit blind. I just put one foot in front of the other, and in some it's been governed by my parents' advice. My mother is uh, is very practical and very aware of people's feelings, and you know very keen about consequences of actions. My father's very resilient and never gives up. And so the kind of the combination between the two meant I always felt that I was confident that I would succeed in whatever I did. So let's just put one foot in front of the other. I'm not sure that kind of maverick advice, you know, is really what students' parents want to hear. Mm, definitely. But for me, it, you know, it's at that young age, you know, you're 20 to you know, to 30, we should climb as many mountains as we can. Yeah, and It's yeah. not right. Reverse gear, let's go find another one. I totally agree. They say you should be outside your comfort zone. Like, I think there's a zone of like things that I wouldn't tell my mum I'm about to do, but in hindsight she'll be really proud of, yeah. is like usually the best things I've done. <laughs> so like you know, going to North Korea is and so many people who listen to me, it's like it's part of a story that like people are interested in to hear about, but like trying to tell her that I was going to do that, she obviously would say no kind of thing, or she didn't want me to do my gap year, but then like yeah. had loads of cool stories and stuff. And and, then, and every time I'm like thinking of starting a new business, I'm like, oh, you could get a job. And I'm like, yeah, but... <laughs> and so it's so just it's a kind of a good gauge of like but once i've done it she's always very happy with me but this won't work for this audience in 3i terms the the investment role was called a controller mm. you were meant to control the investment process but my mum never understood what i did and she associated the controller with the fat controller in thomas the tank engine <laughs> a combination of uh, physical attributes and a children's cartoon <laughs> Mm. That was she pictured me in my roles. And if there's one thing I would stress to anybody, there's the value of mentors. And it doesn't have to be a formal program. I was very lucky in that I had people who looked out for me in all of my roles. It's hard to explain what the 1980s was like, but I had an old older gentleman who was the corporate banker who took care of me and when I was a graduate at Midland. And he taught me the human side of your banking. He, he taught me that if you wanted to get an appointment with the CEO of a manufacturing company in Sussex and Kent, how you approached the receptionist staff or how you approached the, the people underneath the person you're trying to meet made all the difference to actually get to that appointment or get it into the right context you know, mm. what you want to meet. So he taught me how to listen and then how to reflect back what I've been told. All the way to my my mentor at Three I, he was really grumpy in the morning. I mean, really just not happy chap until it was several cups of coffee into the day. But his team would literally fight in the trenches for him, and that skill of it's not about your personality and never got it's about what you do. And so he taught me that how you protect your team from the externalities. You know, meant that their loyalty on the internal stuff, it was greatly, greatly enhanced. So we'd have situations where I might have made a small mistake or two. I might have overpromised, and in the meeting where he was getting me out of trouble, he he was hundred percent supportive, right behind me, managed to to get me out with pride intact and no damage yes. done. Back in the office, I got a ticking off and a, a kind of a, an education of how not to do it again. But my respect for him for not throwing me under the bus in front of people meant that I would work for him for nothing. Every mentor you have, you you, know, you take forward. She wouldn't like me to tell you, but we, we uh, the chairman of Drake Prisbury, Karen, I always use her to you know, bounce off life advice or you know, career advice because she's managed thousands of people in a massive corporate and been an entrepreneurial lady in her own right investing her own money into you know into projects mm. you know tiny operations and depth and breadth of experience add on to life means that i will always use mentors it doesn't have to be a formal program 
just yeah. finding people that you respect and look up to and then actually using them to help. I had mentors with my original business and I've sort of, like I kept them on sort of afterwards, but I kind of went into like a, in the last sort of few years, more of a phase of like just trying random different things and sort of traveling the world and sort of just finding as many different mountains and things just to like sort of see what they look like rather than actually to fully trying to climb them or anything. And so I found it was much easier to ask for a mentor when you're kind of specifically on a mission, be like, oh, I need really help with this. Whereas like my whole life, <laughs> and you're a bit like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's a, can be a bit harder, but have you got any advice for how someone in that kind of situation would find a mentor? For me, it's always been a consequence of action. So I work with you, I build up trust. Mm. I'm quite open. So I, I genuinely believe if I give something of me to you, that you will give something of you to me. It has to be that way around. You know, I'm not expecting anything from you, but if I open up and share a fear or share a concern, then you will do likewise. And it's through that experience that I've made the connection with the people I've trusted. Obviously, the the deeper the connection, the, the, mm. the ability you can have like answers, questions and answers. And yeah, yeah. The more shallow, the more professional. Yeah, I think there's certainly like a whole part of this trying to learn to go a bit deeper as quick as possible kind of thing without going too fast because it's a bit weird. And in my personal style, I think you set the own boundaries by how much you give. If I just want this to be a professional relationship and I just give you an insight into my professional thinking, if I want to open mm. it up, then you do it little by little, but you, you see what I mean? You... Yeah, yeah, definitely. On um, the sort of uh, being young and like success thing, so then there's quite a few young people that become successful just because they start a business or otherwise they kind of seem to have to follow more of the logical path, like being a banker to kind of slowly get up their mountain. Is there any kind of examples that you know of of people that become really successful, like become like a CEO or something of a company, but they didn't start the business, but they somehow like got to be there by like 30? I, I, I don't believe there is a set path. When I spoke about entrepreneurship and how in 2006, it was my greatest buzz. Well, why were you were 36? Why did it take so long? In my answer was, a, I've always thought I was entrepreneurial. I was working in a team of six, by and large, throughout my professional career. They've always been quite small teams. And so I always felt like I had maximum influence. I was always protected from party politics or from mm. corporatism or, you know, the, the horrible parts that I don't, don't particularly like. And so all I was incentivized to do was to perform to my best come up with innovative ideas, some fail, some work, but just keep moving forward as a team. And actually, the, the bit when I got to 36 and we created Esprit, it was just because that was my window. You know, mm. you know, that was our time in the sum where the partners of Casanova agreed a deal with the partners of J.B. Morgan and some collateral damage of that transaction was our little division. And that was our opportunity you know, to go alone. I never had that opportunity before. I had opportunities to leave to go and work for another corporate, but that was never my motivator. Um, and so it was, it was something that I didn't, I didn't plan. I didn't follow a route map to get there. But when, when the time came, kind of took that opportunity. So throughout our portfolio, there are numerous examples of, you know, founders, you know, who take the business, you know, so far and then pass on to, your professional management team. If you read the research, a colleague of mine now works for Adam Street, and there's some research about how the success of founder-led businesses mm. you know, versus professional management. I always tell my founders that whatever their journey, be in charge of it. So like your example of your tech mm. you know, inventor, he, he was in charge of his journey and that he recognized his skill sets and made sure that he did the first outreach. Too many, the best situations I've always found is actually where the, the founder finds the right role for themselves and solves the problem themselves by looking in the mirror and recognizing the skill sets they need to fill. I always think that I, that, that always leads to the best success. It's a hard one to tell someone to do kind of thing, but it's can be so much more useful for yourself if you kind of put yourself in like the sphere of what you're best at and maybe you don't want to be in boardrooms the whole time and you do like doing other things and I, I, yeah it's I, like I mean it was natural from a Draper Esprit perspective we try and get people 
to have a style to talk honestly and openly early. Mm. My son always uh, describes it as in a cricket terms. I know this might not go so well for your international audience, <laughs> but too many parents, you, you know, are kind of not honest with their children when they're coaching them in sport. And my son was always, as the captain of the cricket team, listens to other parents say, "Don't worry, you got out to a, mm. a good ball or whatever." And my son just got just missed. He just missed it. Yeah, and, and that kind of honesty of actually. Yeah, this is what I did wrong, but let's not worry about that. Let's worry about what I'm going to do next time to make yeah, sure it doesn't happen again. You know, it's not a maturity thing in such in that this young, my young kid can pick it up. Mm. But it is if you speak to people openly, honestly, and directly early when it becomes difficult and you yeah. don't change your style, the message might be harder to take. Mm. But at least they have comfort that. You're genuine. And so we try and tell people to always approach it you know, in that way. When you make the original investment, everyone's happy and on a high. So that is your time to get the baseline of how you're going to communicate with yeah, people yeah. and get it accepted. Otherwise, it sort of seems like you're taking a step back. I mean, but sort of it's like, these are the things that you always need to think about. Yeah. It, much more I really, but it, you know, people don't like change. And, and, they, and if you change your voice or you change your behaviorism, you change the way that you... You know, it sends nervous signals. And so that's why there was a Three Eyes marketing campaign back in the 80s and 90s. It used to be a weekly calendar. And I think about a three size calendar that was a cartoon. And I always liked this boardroom picture of this chairman saying, honesty is the best policy. Let's call that option A. Now, what's option B? I always chuckled with that because I thought if I was never honest i wasn't clever enough to work out what stories or what game i was playing and so i learned very early that this is me mm. you know and if i say this to you and you don't like it i'm really sorry but i'm saying it because yeah, yeah. i believe it <laughs> and i'm humble enough to know that i'm often wrong so if mm. i'm wrong then please challenge me and then we can have a dialogue and i found that if you got that in early enough and that they were they got comfortable with the way that you communicated and the way you behave, and they trusted you when things got bad. Yeah, which leads into you know, being a good mentor is like being able to establish trust and things, and also just full on the growth mindset attitude of just being open and honest to things and taking on feedback is just how you improve so much faster. And like, it's how you grow yourself rather than like having a fixed mindset of thinking that you're great and never being able to like take new things on. I think feedback is great. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a yeah, you know, the the feedback is a gift, and you should accept all gifts. Yeah, yeah. Although some pairs of socks at Christmas are not the ones you want, I don't think people naturally love negative feedback. Yeah, you know, it's. I don't wake up in the morning. I think, gosh, wouldn't it be great if someone shone a light of my imperfections? So personally, I've developed a style where I can almost step outside of my body and, and look back at myself and hear the feedback and say, "Yes, you're right. You really should." improve your communication or you you know you should improve your outreach and that's kind of the way i've been able to deal with it but i do think as an investor one of the key attributes i look for is can they listen Mm -hmm. their listening skills is i think is a is a clear barometer of whether the thing's going to be successful or not i mean have you heard what i've said and even if it disagrees with you have you taken the four percent of nugget that i've given you even yeah, you disagree yeah. with the other 96%. Yeah, I think that's that is one of the things that I think I was always I think quite good at listening when I was young because I wasn't so good at talking, so I like got people to talk to me and stuff mm-hmm. and try to just make the conversation as interesting as possible for myself. So it's something interesting to listen to. But I think when you're kinda of young and people give you advice and things, it doesn't always feel like it applies to you or they'll tell you mm-hmm. stories about things that you don't quite conceptually realise, but I think as you get a bit older and you start giving other people advice, you can see the difference between when someone like listened and took it on and realized it versus when it didn't. And then, the, then you kind of get like, the meta level of, oh, when I'm getting advice from my mentor, they actually know what they're talking about. You're like, crap, I actually really have to listen because it's like the most valuable thing that I we just learn by messing up yeah. and can take a bit of a while. I think you're uh, getting your point across in a way that actually is succinct, easy to understand and easy to repeat, I think is a real skill. People often ask me why I started the podcast and there's lots of reasons, but I think I kind of wanted to have a voice and develop my skills to do that because I've always been really good at listening and having opinions on things. 
and felt like I could be the person that sort of says the four sentences. Like I've got like the idea there, but then like wasn't necessarily always so able to execute what I wanted to have come out of my mouth kind of thing. And it's just been like really good practice to just get better at explaining things, I guess. But and I'm, I'm not very good at it. Yeah. Uh, it's a, I, I, I constantly. I don't know why I said, yeah. You, I constantly, you've been quite good. Um, yeah, constantly mm. learning from the best to, to, to try and get more and more succinct and more and more. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's really point. humbling to be with rooms with people who are super good at it and you're like, oh, I thought I was good, but I'm actually really bad. Nice. So have there been any other kind of top life tips that you feel like you should share with people that maybe haven't come up in terms of like maybe sort of more like relationship side of outside of work things? Or just general life, anything else? Like. So I um, I listened last night to your podcast when you turned 30. Oh, yeah. Because I turned 50 About last 30. week. Nice. It's <laughs> and topical. so it was topical and I had a huge smile because uh, you know, it's completely relatable to the, the, the lady who's been with me since the Casano days. Uh, she came along to a party at home in, in where I was. And we were in a pub. Um, but we had the upstairs of the pub. And the nice thing was that she says, your friends, they look like you. And they were friends from school and they were friends from university and they were friends from the town and stuff. And it, it was kind of reassuring that, that actually if you are true to yourself, then actually the people that you pick up along the way of life's journey will have something in common with each other, you know, the way they, they behave and the way that they see fun and the way that uh, they make jokes or... And that, that actually was really interesting, watching through the lens of someone else. She knew my mum and dad, obviously my wife, but she didn't know the, you know, the friends from school or the friends from university or the friends from you know, the town. So was, uh, I do think there is something about that, uh, how you bet, how, stay true to yourself mm. because that's the people that you're going to take with you in life journey. I, I think the biggest thing that I picked up was all about risk. And risk is, is neither good nor not bad if, if you are risk averse or you're a risk taker. It's just understanding it. Understanding when you are outside your comfort zone is just as important as getting outside of your comfort zone. So I think that was something that that came to me when we took Draper's Free Public in, in 2016. And suddenly I was exposed to a whole new world of language that I had no idea what they were talking about. And it was only when I was able to get them to explain the underlying meaning of the acronyms they were using with me or the the terms they were using that I actually found out I did all this anyway or I knew how to yeah. do this. I just called it something different. But I perceived it to be quite scary risk because I, these people were so much more knowledgeable than I were and they were so much more skilled in the areas of public companies until I had actually someone with me to explain it and actually this common sense and it was well within my comfort zone and actually yeah. I understood about governance and I understood about you know risk because that's what we did with venture capital so that was interesting to me but the, the whole kind of if, if you know where you are it doesn't yeah. matter whether it's you know, less risky or more risky it's just, just you just knowing where you are on that, that curve yeah kind of I have been things. interviewing a lot over the last couple of years obviously to go from 12 to, to 40 and at the end of every interview I I found my ask, I found asking myself what non profit would you be the CEO of? Because I actually found I actually found out that people's drivers were way above the the why do you want to be a venture capital, why do you want to be in marketing, why do you do podcast podcast? And you know, I'm 50, and it's taken me kind of 50 years mm. <laughs> to realize actually that if I can ask that question, I can get an insight into what what drives people outside of the need to earn a paycheck to to do what they want to do. Was much more enlightening than anything else I can ask. I could ask what they did at the weekends, or I could ask what they did for fun. I could ask what sport they played. But actually asking people if they were given a free ride to be a CEO of a non-profit, what would they do? I have found to be one of the most enlightening questions. Yeah, I think so. that is a question I like to ask people is what their, their favorite interview question is. And that I think might be my favorite answer so far. That's really good. Because, yeah, it's so, so true. Like 
what is like your real driver behind things and what do you be doing for the rest of your time i've been working on an idea basically i've been like podcasting and listening to books and things a lot and it's quite like a lonely pursuit as in you do it by yourself <laughs> and because i want to make a thing that allows you to listen like in sync with other people so you could like listen to like three podcasts a week with your wife so that you can actually talk about the things yeah. you've listened to together or like if you listen to a book you can kind of be in sync on the chapter so like same as you might watch tv episodes together like chapter by chapter you can like talk about the whole thing so if it's like a self-help book you can actually talk about each of the things in each chapter and like think about the take-homes and actually like with your mentor maybe like actually discuss what you're going to like implement rather than just doing it by yourself yeah. which is sort of you listen to all these great things and ideas and it sort of stirs something to do but then you never quite go and do it and so it's just sort of i think it make it a much more effective way of doing things and it makes you feel more like socially connected to people so there's quite a lot of loneliness and like people want to improve their lives and lots of people just listening to lots of content on the phone mindlessly by themselves so it seems like it is quite it's in like the right position to start getting adopted as a thing so that's kind of my new business idea that i'm working on uh, i like sports management and strategy i see a game like a chess game i i, I love to know why people make the moves and i read eddie james's autobiography yeah, uh, it's on the plane as, yeah and the, the rugby guy and the two things that really struck me that I would have loved to have your concept was the lengths he went to to get 1% improvement mm. were just phenomenal. I mean, just, and then on the flip side, I would have loved your technology was just to, to say to people, am I reading this right? But throughout mm. his biography, he keeps making the same mistake. He targets the, the battle and mm. he gets his team to the top of the hill to win the battle. And then the very next game, he loses the war. And, and so the, the beat in New Zealand in the semi-final of this year or last year's Rugby World Cup was the battle. But actually, the war was beating South Africa in the final. Yeah, yeah. And when you read his autobiography, there's like four or five different times in his career where he's got to the summit. Mm. But, um, but not... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for someone who's... He, he's an educator. He was a teacher and then a, a principal you know, at a school. And uh, for somebody who's such a thinker, it's really interesting reading this book. And I would have loved to have hit pause. Yeah. I go, am I reading this right? <laughs> you know, is this is this South Africa example? Is that exactly the same as these other two examples yeah, in yeah. his previous life? Yeah. Mm, it's so interesting when you kind of can have a conversation with someone else and see yeah. like how they interpret things. Because I've learned so much. It's like I said, I'm running a, I don't know, I was with Ollie. I, I'm running a new podcast with a friend where we just read a, the same book a week and we kind of explain it to other people and yeah. like, talk about our top lessons and things it's just so fascinating to learn like what someone else thinks about something because mm. you just you only ever get like your viewpoint and like how you read it and like is in you know like with text like it's so easy to like misunderstand someone's text or something it's but with the book you can still misunderstand like what someone's getting across and things and yeah. just people like to think so differently yeah. just, I, I, I see you wrote the Phil, Phil Knight book yeah. yeah so it's a big book that's been gone around here shoe dog and everyone's mm. read it and there's parts of his career where he went with the flow and, and if you stopped him and said, why did you choose to, to create Nike in that way? Or he was like, it was just the next, the next meeting or the next, you know. And then there are other parts where he has most definitely taken a choice to go left or right. And I would have loved to have paused and gone, do you think that's a left and right decision? Or do you think actually he's just going with the, the play? It's a wonderful book if you have read it or haven't read it. It's on my uh, queue of, books to be reading because it sounds really cool yeah i read it because i could see some of myself mm. in some of the decisions yeah. did you ever read jeffrey moore's crossing the chasm i may have read it when i was like sort of 23 years it was in my list that's it yeah yeah, sure. yeah yeah and it's a really simple book to read yeah, yeah it's, it's super like it, obvious but then it's yeah, like if you read a single chapter you get with that song but i think it'd be one of the things that's that's really good to revisit now and be like oh yeah i remember thinking this is really obvious and now i didn't do it <laughs> no yeah. and you put all 13 chapters together what it is yeah. and you go that is genius so. definitely cool so just the last few questions one is what is one of your earliest ever memories that's kind of quite distinct so i can remember the sadness of not being picked for the football team about eight years old i remember crying yeah like an epic crying day to my friends and yeah not, and the kind of the boys not been like I don't know, quite know what to do with a boy that cries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, really distinct kind of yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, memory. Thanks. And then finally, what is the kindest thing that someone has done for you? The kindest thing. When I helped a CEO acquire a number of businesses when I was at 
uh, three I. So we're talking in the nineties, and uh, maybe six or seven transactions we did together. So it's a, it's a, it's a high volume of companies he was buying and selling, not all tech. So we had a professional relationship, and it bordered on friendship. And he was maybe fifteen years older than me, so he wasn't matey matey. But I helped him buy a business, which actually ended up not having room for us to invest. There was an opportunity for us to buy a business. By the time the negotiations happened, he didn't need us. He remembered that. And and when my wife was seriously ill, he repaid that kindness when I really needed it. When I really needed focus to do something else rather than sit in a waiting room in an intensive care unit or when I really needed to get away from the, the situation, he provided that kindness. He probably would never describe it like that. He, he probably just describe it as I would do whatever anybody would do. But it was the you know, it was the one the one single act that I remember from that that kind of period. And it was not monetary, it was not gifts, it, it was just time. Yeah, that's really nice. It's just interesting to learn like different ways that you can sort of be kind in some of the things that maybe like you said, like with the books where things seem obvious, but like actually you don't necessarily always do them when they present themselves. Yeah. And it's just nice to kind of have that like trigger to be like, oh, this is an opportunity to be like kind and useful and often it doesn't even cost you that much kind of thing. The thing I remember is time. Mm. Someone gave me their time. And as I said, I recently celebrated my 50th birthday. Mm. One of the most memorable gifts I got, I'm a big Brighton supporter. Mm. My whole family has season ticket holders and we go off to the Brighton. I got given a ball of wool in blue with a ball of wool in white and two knitted needles with a card that said, what do you get somebody who's got everything? How about a knitting pattern? I mean, it was simple in its mm. execution, but in terms of what it meant, <laughs> one I, I'm still smiling yeah. you know, today. I, mean, I have no idea how I'm going to learn to knit, to make a scarf, to be able to give back to this person yeah. on their 50th birthday. <laughs> I've still got to work that out. And so it's just the gift of time, I think, is, mm. uh, is probably the most precious thing. Yeah, that was a really lovely conversation. Thanks so much for, for your time and giving it to uh, yeah. give us all so much advice. Awesome. Is there anything that you want out of this as in people should sort of do as an action or anything? Or are you just kind of happy to be talking fun stuff? I'm happy to meet you, Sam. I'm happy to partake. And uh, no, I don't need anything. Cool. Is there, is there anything I can do for you? Keep talking to people. Keep encouraging them to be happy. Mm. and keep encouraging them to climb mountains. Will do. Thanks so much. <laughs> well, it goes without saying that I really enjoyed that conversation. It was so insightful. And unfortunately, I can't tell you everything of what happened afterwards, but it was one of those conversations where like, I had to start packing up and leaving, but we carried on talking for sort of 20 minutes and it was really interesting. Um, before the interview started, I'd been trying to invest in a company called All Plants, which are like a vegan company that do sort of basically ready meals that you can have in your freezer, and they're, but they're really, really healthy and stuff. But anyway, I was having issues with it. And afterwards, he was concerned that I was able to make my investment because he was very of the opinion that like money needs to move to actually like make you rich. And there's no point kind of just having money and savings. You have to be doing stuff with it. And he kind of went quite deep into the, his philosophies around that and investing and getting a good return on things. So yeah, he has some great views on kindness and like how to use mentors to get the best out of you. And also just, you know, how to kind of show up and maybe say not everything that's on your mind and kind of digest things a bit more and, and kind of come across as a more intelligent person in the room by saying less. It's quite useful. So yeah, lots of really useful opinions and like how to build a life when you, know, you always need to know exactly what direction you're going if you're just getting a useful experience. And if you just always show up and are useful for people, it sort of, can pay you back dividends in the long run. So that was some really good principles from Stuart and very happy to have had him on the podcast. Congratulations on listening to a whole episode of the Growth Mindset Podcast. Before you race into another podcast, try pausing. Ask yourself, what have you learned? What could you change? How will you make that change happen? Did you press pause? Knowledge is useless without action. What did you learn? What should you change? And how will you make that change happen? 
You can tell us what you learned by contacting us through the website, growthmindsetpodcast.com. And feel free to connect with us or our guests, or just peruse the show notes. Our Instagram is at growthmindsetpodcast, or follow me at samjamsnaps for a daily reminder to stop using Instagram. If you enjoy random acts of kindness and want to support the show, you can support us on Patreon or leave us a review on iTunes and you'll make me very happy. And with that, keep learning and keep growing.